How many people here have been to Geneva, Switzerland? Raise your hand. Very few. Very few people, it seems, have made the Protestant pilgrimage. Well, one of the great tourist attractions of the city of Geneva is what's called the Reformation Wall, which is a massive concrete wall that features sculptures on the wall of significant reformers. And there are four reformers in particular that are featured front and center, and they're larger than the other reformers that you find on the wall. And they are John Calvin, Theodore Beza, William Forel, and John Knox, all significant reformers who had a connection to the city of Geneva. But if you stand back from the wall, and it's hardly noticeable if you're up close, if you stand back from the wall, you notice that there is a large Latin phrase that's inscribed almost across the entire length of the wall. And the Latin phrase is post tenebris lux, after darkness, light. That Latin phrase was initially a Calvinist slogan that made, even made it onto coins in Geneva, but it became a slogan for the whole Protestant Reformation. After darkness, light. Well, what was so dark at the time of the Reformation? Well, the church was dark. And you remember, or some of you at least will know the story of Martin Luther and how he, on October 31st, we're approaching Reformation Day, aren't we? On October 31st, 1517, he nailed to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany, his 95 theses, 95 statements of debate, of protest, in fact, against things that were occurring in the church of his day. And the main abuse that he highlighted was the sale of indulgences. The Pope had issued pieces of paper, and if you purchased one of these pieces of paper, you could be assured with the seal of the Pope that the souls of family members in purgatory would be immediately released. And this got Luther irate, because it showed that the church was greedy, it was a cash cow, and they were using this money to fund the construction of an ornate cathedral in Rome, and it was breaking the backs of poor people. The church was dark, and it was dark because it was greedy. And you're not just listening now to a Protestant who's speaking bad about the Catholic Church. A lot of my Roman Catholic friends agree with me that there were things occurring in the medieval church which should not have been occurring. But in the darkness, light began to shine, and God raised up reformers like John Calvin and like Theodore Beza to dust off the ways in which the gospel had been clouded and to let the full light of the gospel shine <clears throat> after darkness, light. Well, what we discover in our text this morning is that the sanctuary at Shiloh, the central sanctuary for Israelites, had become dark, had become dark through corruption. But we're going to see how God raises up a faithful priest in the corrupt sanctuary. And this little boy, to become a faithful priest warrior, would shine light in the darkness. And in so doing would, of course, anticipate the Lord Jesus Christ, the great light of the world, who shines in the darkness that we sadly too often encounter. 
So as we reflect on these verses from 1 Samuel 2, we see how God raises up a faithful priest in a corrupt sanctuary. We're first going to pay some attention to the corrupt priests, specifically Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, and then we're going to look at the young faithful priest. So the text begins by saying, now the sons of Eli were worthless fellows. Verse 12, they did not know the Lord. Perhaps you remember from a couple of weeks ago, I gave the literal Hebrew of this phrase, which is the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. That's what they They were sons of the devil. They were a brood of the one great viper. They were scoundrels. They were delinquents. Well, how were the sons of Eli scoundrels? Well, they were explicitly, against better knowledge, violating the law of God, which prescribed for the priest's consumption only a specific portion of the sacrificial animal in the peace offering. So you know that with some of the offerings, you think of the whole burnt offering, the whole animal was put on fire and its smoke was food for God. But with the peace offering, the priest would have a little bit of the food, a little bit of the animal. The Israelite worshiper would have part of the animal and the rest would be burned up in smoke as food for the Lord. But you discover in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy that the priest could only have, have the shoulder. He could have the stomach. And he could have a few other portions. But the sons of Eli were gluttonous. They weren't happy with what the law of God allotted for them. And they wanted more. And so they confiscated from worshippers meat that was not allocated for them. Verses 13 and 14. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. It's really a disturbing scene, isn't it? Here you have this Israelite man. He's cooking his portion of the peace offering for a sacrificial meal to enjoy with his family. And along comes the priest servant with a three product, and he thrusts it into the pan, takes back whatever he pulls out to the priest's quarters to enjoy for himself. It's the first potluck meal at church. We don't use the term potluck so much anymore, do we? We found that objectionable. What, what, what word do we use now? Pot providence. So much of it. <laughs> do you know the meaning of potluck? The idea is you eat whatever is in the pot. You don't have a choice. You're not selecting items off of the menu. You eat whatever is in the pot. And it's not the way priests were supposed to eat. A specific portion of the sacrificial animal was theirs and not their portion. There's a second sin, a second deviation that these priests are guilty of. The sons of Eli wanted raw meat, not boiled meat. Specifically, they wanted the fat. Isn't it interesting that already then, I was going to say they enjoyed bacon, but that's not true, is it? But they enjoyed fat. They enjoyed fat. And that's what the priest wanted to, to eat. But that portion of the animal was supposed to be burnt up to the Lord. Verses 15 and 16. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Again, very disturbing. These were the leaders of the church. Give me that meat. And if you don't, I'll take it. I imagine a priest servant flexing his muscles at that point, 
or something like that. So there are all kinds of liturgical deviations here, all kinds of ways in which the priests are encouraging the violation of God's law. They want food. That's not allotted for them. They want more food than what is allotted to them. And they're stealing from their fellow Israelites, and they're stealing from the Lord, and their gluttony is a picture of their ministry because they are devouring the people, they are exploiting the Israelites, using them to satisfy their own interests. And it wasn't just contempt for Israel, that's bad enough. The text explicitly tells us it was contempt for the Lord and for his offering. Verse 17, thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated her with contempt. These are derelict priests who have no regard for the law of God. But perhaps this morning you want to cut them a little slack. But you want to say, you know what, the, the book of commandments for priests, especially the book of Leviticus, but also the book of Deuteronomy, that's a complex book. And it must have been hard to master all of those rules, to know exactly what could be eaten and what could not be eaten, to know exactly how each sacrifice had to be offered, to know when a sacrifice could be offered and when a sacrifice could not be offered. You've You've stumbled your way through the book of Leviticus. It seems also confusing. Perhaps they couldn't master it all. I want to assure you this morning that being a mechanic today is far more complex than being a priest then. I'm watching the world for mechanics. I can check my oil. I was going to say change, but that would be fine. I can check my oil. I can change a flat tire with someone's help. And that's about the extent of my automotive expertise. But have you ever been to a mechanic shop and you see these massive manuals? Massive manuals, some of which have been mastered by the mechanics. Being a priest in Israel was not rocket science. You put all of the rules that priests had to master together in a book, it's not a very big book. What in the world is the problem here? We're told at the outset, verse 12, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They did not know the Lord. Which is to say, they did not care about the Lord. They did not love the Lord. They had become careless in their lives. And that carelessness in their lives became a cavalier attitude in their priesthood. They did not know the Lord. They knew a lot about him. They could have aced the priest exam. They could have aced the theological exam. They didn't care. If we were to translate this into our day, we would say they didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you see, that's actually quite a scary thing. If you ignore the Lord and don't allocate time in your schedule to pray to him, don't allocate time in your schedule to spend with him. And don't allocate time in your schedule to read his word for you. Something happens. And what happens is your conscience becomes dull. And you develop a cavalier attitude towards others. And as a pastor, when I encounter people who whose lives are spiraling for one reason or another, involving sin, I like to pose the question, what place does prayer have in your lives? If your marriage is on shaky grounds, how often are you as a couple holding hands and praying together? 
Ignoring the Lord will desensitize you to his word, will dull your conscience. Even when this happens to church leaders. And that's what we're talking about here, aren't we, with the sons of Eli. It's a terrible thing when this happens to church leaders. God is offended, but the people suffer. And the people of Israel are here suffering. This whole passage from verse 12 all the way to verse 21 is very clear. You have the liturgical gluttony in the passage that we're looking at. In the passage that follows in the remainder of chapter 2, we have the sexual immorality of Eli's sons. And if this piece were put to music, it would be a dirge. But in our verses this morning, there's a lovely intermezzo in the midst of the dirge. There is in this corrupt sanctuary with gluttonous and nefarious priests a young boy, a little lad, who is ministering before the Lord. And if you read the text carefully, if you listen to the text sensitively, you see this emerging contrast between Eli's natural sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and Eli's adopted son, Samuel. His natural children treat the sacrifice of the Lord with contempt, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a young boy. And he's being introduced to us, isn't he, as a rival priest, as an alternative priest to Hophni and Phinehas. He's a Levite and not a priest, let's be, let's be clear. But he's wearing the linen ephod, part of the priest's attire. Even the verb minister is, is a verb that's often used of priests and his mother, has made this lovely priestly robe that he would wear is the word the, the Hebrew word robe is the one that's used of the high priest robe. There is in this corrupt sanctuary with corrupt and delinquent priests an alternative priest, a rival priest who's just a little boy. There's something very heartwarming about what Hannah does here for her son. Is it there? She would visit the central sanctuary with Elkanah once a year. Every year Samuel would grow a little bit higher. And every year she would bring him a new robe to wear for the year. It reminds me a little bit of, of the mother of Henry Nowen. That's a name I've mentioned before. Henry Nowen, he's now passed away, but he became a psychologist and taught at Notre Dame and at Yale and at Harvard, very prestigious university point. He gave up his career in academia, decided to work among the mentally disabled at the large community called Daybreak in Toronto. Jessica Gorska in our congregation works at Larsh with the mentally disabled. But I learned reading the biography of Henry Nowen that when he was just a young boy, he wanted to be a priest. His mother in the Netherlands worked in a department store and she had the carpenter of the store make him a little miniature altar. Had the seamstress of the store make him some priestly vestments. And Henry now, as a young boy, converted the attic of their home into a little chapel. He would play mass and he would deliver sermons to his parents and to his friends. How to be popular with kids your age. <laughs> Come over to my house, let's go in the attic, and I'll uh, lead a service for you and preach to you. Well, there must have been some people who came. Two side points. The American psychologist James Hillman says that geniuses, in most instances, have some idea when they're very young about what they want to be when they go to <coughs> He provides all these stats and gives all these illustrations of people who have experienced extraordinary success in life and had some idea early on what they wanted to be, what they wanted to be. Another sidebar, positive psychologists say that you're more likely to be a happy person if you have a lifelong ambition and stick with that lifelong ambition throughout your life. Maybe carpentry, maybe 
maybe teaching, maybe running. Samuel was a lifelong Nazarite, a lifelong warrior priest for whom the whole world was a sanctuary. Did not choose this role. Most Nazarite vows were temporary vows. You took it, you had it for a while, you cut your hair, you burned it, and it was over. There are only three, as I indicated before, there are only three lifelong Nazarites mentioned in Scripture. John the Baptist, Samson, Samuel. Samuel embraced the vocation. Samson, for most of the time, resisted it. It was involuntary. Why shouldn't he resist it, you say? That accounts for the difference between Samuel and Samson. I have to believe it's partly Hannah. We don't need to be told about Hannah, but we are. Why? Because we need to be told about her. And we have this saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And as Christian believers, we can nod at that saying. There's a lot of truth in that. We're told about Samuel's mother, how she prayed for him, how she cared for him, how she nurtured his relationship with the Lord, how he, she nurtured him in his vocation before the Lord. We're told of Jesus, not insignificantly. We do not hold to Mariolatry, and yet we believe that Mary is blessed among women. She was an extraordinary person. God handpicked her to be the mother of Jesus, and she did a remarkable job. Little Caden will be baptized this morning. Will not, I assume, be born into the Nazarite vow, unless the will of course have not shared something with me. But isn't it interesting that he will be born into a vocation? He'll be born into the vocation of prophet, priest, and king. Wear those offices initially like an oversized shirt. But he will need to grow into them. And he will grow into them by the grace of the Lord, but with the help of his parents, Tim and Melissa. And God ascribes to parents a very significant role in the raising of children as they prepare to enter these lifelong vocations, prophet, priest, and king. And you say, well, how can I be a good parent? Well, that's a question I ask, and that's a question I struggle with. But the place to begin is with prayer, isn't it? By praying for our children, by praying with our children. And just by doing that, you're well on the way, parent, biblically. It's hard to get praying often and with your children. Hannah and Mary are parallel in Scripture. I've drawn attention to some of the parallels before. Hannah means, in Hebrew, favored one. When Gabriel comes to Mary, she says, Hail, O favored one. Both Hannah and Mary identify themselves as the Lord's servant. Both sing songs about how the Lord is going to bring down the elites and how he's going to lift up the humble. But the parallels don't stop there. We're going to look at this in more detail next time, but what does it say of Samuel in verse 26? Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and favor with the Lord and also with man. What does it say of Jesus in Luke 2.52? And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Samuel points to Jesus. Because Jesus, as a little boy, would grow up in a corrupt and dark sanctuary, would grow up in a dark and corrupt world. God had not taken leave of the world in the Middle Ages when the church became dark. God had not taken leave of the world when the shadow sanctuary became dark. God had not taken leave of the world 
When Hophni and Phinehas were priests, he did not take leave of the world when Annas and Caiaphas were priests. But he planned new beginnings. He planned fresh starts in the wombs of the barren and the virgin. Two little boys born in lowly circumstances, and they both grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Anna anticipates and previews Mary, but Samuel anticipates and previews Jesus, who becomes not just the great priest, but the greatest priest, who offers up himself on the cross as a sacrifice to atone for our sins, to defeat the power of sin and death, and who rose three days later. The greatest basis for hope in the world today, the resurrection of Jesus' death, doesn't have the last word. Didn't have the last word for Jesus, doesn't have the last word for those who are joined to Jesus in faith. Is the world dark today? Is your life dark today? A lot more dark than for others. What happens at night? Things become dark. We abide in a moment of darkness. And then what happens? There's light. It's invariably true. There's never been a day that worked differently. But after darkness comes light. Post tenebrous loops. And the light began to shine dark sanctuary in Shiloh, light began to shine, a dark region of Palestine that began to emanate through the world. And if in your life you're in the darkness of night, morning is coming. Jesus, the Bible says, is the morning star, one who brings us the light of the morning. When you hear the phrase post tenebrous loops, you can think of the Reformation, that's fine. You can think of your life, that's very appropriate. Think most of Jesus, the morning star, who brings light to people in darkness. Amen. Amen.